Well, welcome to our webinar on the consequences of involving an American in your non-US business. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by Esquire Group and the VLJ US Tax Advisory FCE. Uh, your presenters today are myself, Jimmy Sexton, uh, Virginia Latori Ecker, and Reiner Figa Coleman. Uh, before we jump into our webinar, just a brief disclaimer that this webinar was prepared for educational purposes. It is not tax or legal advice. Uh, if you need any tax or legal advice, uh, feel free to give us a call. Uh, so I'm going to hand this over uh, to you now, Virginia, and let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I've been admitted to the New York State Bar since 1984, and I've lived abroad for the past 30 some odd years in Hong Kong and Dubai. I've been in the United Arab Emirates since 2001. And given my overseas experience, I specialize in international tax planning, the latest changes in U.S. tax laws, tax obligations for American expats and foreign persons with any U.S. connections. And of course, I have a strong background in FATCA, how to become tax compliant through one of the IRS special programs that are currently in existence. Expatriation is another big matter on which I deal. And I have recently been delving into the interplay between Sharia law and US law as, as this affects tax matters. So um, I'm happy to help with anyone who has questions in any of those areas. And uh, you can see uh, where Virginia's bio is available there uh, at uh, the link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, if you don't subscribe to her blog, you should. It's really good. Uh, my name is Jimmy Sexton. I'm the founder and CEO of Esquire Group. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Business Administration, uh, a JD, and an LLM in International Taxation. Uh, I founded Esquire Group in 2005, so I've been at this for, for over a decade. Uh, Esquire Group has offices in Austria, Germany, the U.S., and the UAE. Uh, I specialize in strategic consulting and international taxation, including uh, U.S. citizens with foreign income or assets, expatriation, family offices, succession planning, and uh, wealth structuring for ultra-high net worth individuals and SMEs. I'm fluent in English and German. Uh, if you want to know more about me, my uh, link to my uh, bio is down here at the bottom of this slide. And now I'm going to hand this over to Reiner to let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Reiner Figa Coleman. I'm an enrolled agent and senior tax consultant at Esquire Group. Um, I hold my bachelor's and master's of science. Um, I've worked in Austria, Germany, Indonesia, um, and now currently based out of the United Arab Emirates. Um, similar to Jimmy, I specialize in international tax issues regarding uh, American citizens and residents abroad, um, also with topics such as expatriation, foreign unreported income and assets, uh, investing or doing business abroad, as well as foreign investment in the United States. Um, my full bio is available in the link below on Esquire Group's website. Right. Um, I think that most people are becoming very aware of the implications of having an American involved in, in any of their foreign businesses. This is now becoming a very hot topic and one that people really have to pay close attention to. Congress and the IRS are focusing very harshly on foreign asset tax information reporting, and they're doing this in order to push and get U.S. tax compliance and hopefully to close the so-called uh, tax gap. The implications of having an American involved in your foreign business are very far reaching. There is definitely on the horizon U.S. tax reporting requirements becoming stronger and more robust because they want more and more information in order to be able to connect all of the dots. And even though you think you have a foreign business and you may not have any U.S. tax implications, you're sorely mistaken if you've got a U.S. person involved in any way in that business. This means you have an expanded risk and exposure, not only in terms of the information you will be needing to divulge to the IRS, but you never know where that information can lead the IRS. It can lead them, for example, to say, well, you know, we think that some of your income may be U.S. source income and maybe there's some taxes due 
with your foreign business. So once you open the door a little bit and give the IRS information, your risk is greatly increased and you don't know where that may end up leading. And, and Virginia, and, one, one, thing, one, one thing I just wanted to, to add on, on that topic that I think that, that's important to note is that you know when you're involving a U.S. person in, in your foreign business, um, it's not actually you as, as the foreigner uh, and, and maybe the primary owner of the business that actually is going to give the information to the IRS because the IRS doesn't have a jurisdiction over a U.S. person. What's gonna, what winds up happening a lot of times unbeknownst to the foreigner uh, or the foreign mm -hmm. partner or foreign owner is that the U.S. person, by virtue of their U.S. citizenship, has to give all this information on you know, the income and expenses of the company, the company's assets and all this stuff. And now the foreigner might not even know that the U.S. has all this information um, j just because they had a U.S. partner or maybe a U.S. officer in their company. And now all this information has to get divulged into the U.S. And then you wind up with, with some of these problems like, like you just mentioned. Correct. Absolutely. And the implications are so far reaching, Jimmy. We've, we've seen this. Reiner's also seen this. For example, when, when a foreign business is involved in what's a so-called boycotting country, having operations in a boycotting country, such as Yemen or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, these are on a list that Reiner will go through with us later that requires extensive information to be filed by the U.S. person that, that might be involved in that business. And some of this can be very, very sensitive. So the implications are quite far-reaching. What I've seen recently, from as told to me by a colleague in Canada, a tax professional in Canada, he has a number of clients coming to him needing to expatriate and get rid of their U.S. citizenship because their foreign business partners don't want any Americans involved in their business. And they're saying, if you want to join us and become an investor, etc., you really need to give up the citizenship. So, of course, these people are dual nationals and do have another citizenship to rely on. But the point is that American citizenship is becoming, in a way, a paria of society. So people have to look yeah. very carefully at what they're doing. Yeah, we're, 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 seeing, we're seeing at the Esquire Group, you know, we're seeing a lot, of, much like you. I mean, we work on a lot of the cases together, Virginia. We're, we're, we're seeing more, more and more of this. And I'm, we're also seeing more and more, like, investment funds and things like that, uh, basically excluding Americans. But uh, going back to, to you know, involving a, a foreigner in your business and some of the specific requirements um, that might, you know, ha have to be disclosed on, on, you know, this foreign business by, by a U.S. partner uh, that might be partners, you know, with, with a foreigner. Uh, I, I think we'll turn this over to Reiner to talk about some of these specific implications and some of the specific information that, that would have to be provided to the IRS. Yeah, so Reiner. I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to cover some of the basics on the, the reporting and compliance issues when having an American involved in, in a foreign uh, corporation or partnership. Um, so most of the case, in mo most examples, we are talking about a foreign corporation or partnership when we're talking about a foreign entity with, with multiple uh, shareholders involved. So there's, there's two main forms which, which are reported to the IRS that gets reported by the, the U.S. party. So this would be either a U.S. director or shareholder. Um, these forms are 5471 and 8865. Um, to understand when these, get when these need to be completed and filed with the IRS, uh, I'll give you a simplified version of when they need to actually be prepared. Um, so when, when you have a foreign corporation or partnership where more than 50% of the stock is controlled by a U.S. person, or a case where more than 10% of the stock was acquired or disposed of by a U.S. person. Um, these are two main criteria which which spark such a reporting requirement. And there's also uh, also in some instances where someone might not even be a shareholder just by the fact that they're a director or officer of an entity. 
they might also be required to complete these forms and, and uh, disclose information to the IRS. So what kind of information actually gets remitted to the IRS? Um, there's different filing categories, so it, it varies on, on the specific situation, but the most common information that needs to be reported are full financial statements, so an income and expense statement, a balance sheet where you have to disclose uh, you know, items such as cash, real estate, you know, the liabilities, all sorts of uh, financial information. And then there's also a section which needs to report transactions when a U.S. person acquires or disposes of their interest. And this also requires the, the reporting person to disclose who the U.S. person acquired their interest from. So if the if an American acquires part of a business, they are actually most likely going to need to report the name and address of the foreigner from who they purchased their interest. Things I wanted to, to add to that is it's not only um, you know who they they purchased the interest to, but also if an American sells their interest, you know they have to disclose who they sold it to along with their, their name right. and address. So it, it gets disclosed both coming in and, and coming out. And like you said, the financial statements, um, yeah, I mean, you're giving giving everything to the IRS. I mean, those 5471s are almost like a corporate tax return. Yeah. Um, and I, but, uh, I want to point out that it's it's the U.S. person that, that needs to transmit this information. So if you are a foreigner involved in a business with an American, it's it's possible that you have no way of knowing that some of your, uh, you know, company information or your personal information was remitted because it's something you might not be involved with. It's going to be the American party that's that's transmitting this information related to the company. Um, so to, to give you an example, let's look at John, who is a U.S. citizen. He's a CFO, so an officer for Techco, a U.K. startup company. Mary is also a U.S. citizen and has decided to invest in TechCo. Mary acquired 12% of TechCo stock in exchange for a 1 million pound investment. Um, and we can assume the other 88% are owned by non-U.S. persons. In a situation like this, both John and Mary are going to need to complete a Form 5471 reporting a uh, foreign entity to the IRS. Um, John, simply due to his the fact that he's an officer in the in a company that has an American shareholder, and Mary, um, because she acquired more than ten percent of of the entity, both of those are are sparking reporting obligations, um, and this would require uh, the fifty four seventy ones to report the income statements and balance sheets to the IRS, um, and as well as information related to the purchase of stock. Um, the, how much was paid for it, and the information related to who the stock was purchased from. Um, so this is just a simple real life example as to the the kind of situations which spark such reporting requirements. And and I think something that's really important, Reiner, about about a situation like this is is like in the case of John, is that you know it, it it's 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 one thing that if you have an American partner. Um, or shareholder that you might think like, okay, they're going to give this, it might have to give this information, you know, to the IRS. I mean, it's a little bit more logical. Um, but in a case, you know, th this is just simply by having an American employee, uh, mm -hmm. you might be forced or, or you might not be forced, but your information may be, you know, transmitted unbeknownst to you simply because you had an, an American, uh, you know, officer of your company. And this, this can and I can also, imagine it yeah. might be difficult in some situations for the officer to get the information, like the balance right. sheet and the profit and loss statements. I mean, th it this is like a even, nightmare. This is even a common issue for shareholders. Um, if if they're, you know, let's just say they have ten percent of an entity, um, it can it can be a major headache for them to to get the information from the other shareholders because the other shareholders will also put up a fight that they don't want this information. Um, released and, and not made public, but um, shared with other parties. And that's why, that's why they're not letting U.S. people into these businesses. That's becoming the current trend. Absolutely. Yeah, more and more. Yeah. Um, 
And another form I want to mention, which is uh, often forgotten in, in the reporting world, is 5713, what Virginia mentioned earlier, um, is that the U.S. has a list of international boycott countries. As you can see um, on the slide, they're primarily Middle Eastern countries. Um, but these are... Which is very, which is very relevant <laughs> to where uh, the three of us live. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... So if, if a U.S. And by the way, these are countries that are boycotting Israel. There's so people know Correct. what a boycott means yep. in this context. Correct. Um, to, to, I mean, it is a very complicated form, but to keep things simple, essentially any uh, U.S. shareholder or partner in a foreign entity that's doing business with one of these countries listed or, or even has or simply has operations in, in one of these countries um, is going to have additional filing requirements where they will need to disclose uh, spe specified transactions that that occurred with these countries, um, and there's also uh, tax implications on these where essentially income earned will have a inferior uh, tax treatment if it's related to one of these boycott countries. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the, the normally the big consequences, um, you know, of, of having, uh, you know, participated. I mean, what one aspect is it is, you know, if you do uh, business in one of these countries uh, is filing the 5713 to report that you did business in one of these countries. Um, but that doesn't necessarily automatically result in, in negative tax consequences. Um, if if just you, a reporting requirement, it can right, but it, like like Reiner said, it's a it's a it's a it's a complex one. But if you yes. cooperated with an international boycott or participated in one, that's when when the negative tax consequences come into play. And 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 basically, uh, the tax consequences is you lose uh, your foreign tax credits and uh, you lose the ability to defer any income. Uh, that would otherwise have been been deferrable within within the foreign company. But uh, anyway, go ahead, Correct. Virginia. Yes, I just want to add that most recently, um, in opening up a bank account, so uh, here in the UAE, uh, at a local bank, uh, the client was actually given a form that said you have to be in compliance with the UAE laws and regulations, and that means you you must boycott Israel. So. You can just imagine if this company has a U.S. person involved and they're opening up a simple thing like a bank account and the company is agreeing to boycott Israel based on what they sign with the bank, I think they're going to have a 5713 problem that can result in these harsh tax consequences, loss of foreign tax credits and so on that you're mentioning. Um, and this is a very simple transaction, opening up a bank account. I've never seen it where someone's gotten that form before, but I just saw it last week. So, yeah, I know you sure you shared that with me. That was the the first time yep. I'd ever even heard something like that. But uh, I think it just goes to Correct. show that the world of <laughs> world of compliance is is uh, just growing. It's a tricky world. It's a tricky world. And again, I don't blame businesses for saying we don't want Americans involved. It's just it's it's too dangerous. An area that makes it even more difficult and confusing is when nominees are actually involved in the business. And just so everyone is clear, a nominee is a person or an entity that's named by another party simply to hold title to certain property. So the nominee may be registered as the owner of the property and has title to the property, but he is a mere straw man. He is not the beneficial owner and all the rights and incidents of true ownership belong to the beneficial owner. So the nominee basically is standing in a position of trust. He will follow the orders of the beneficial owner with respect to the asset. If it shares in a company, he'll agree to vote them the way the beneficial owner says to. The dividends will be maybe paid to the nominee because he's the title holder on the shares, but he will be agreeing to turn over the dividends to the beneficial owner. And Typically, where I've seen nominee used is, and where it's troublesome, is where you have a U.S. dual national, so he is a U.S. citizen and has citizenship in a foreign country, and the employer wishes to do business in that foreign country. 
quite often it's administratively easier for the employee who has that other country's nationality to set up the company and hold title to the entity and also to open up all the bank accounts and 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 be a, strictly a nominee in some countries there is a requirement that the um that country's national own a certain percentage of the share so they're going to have a nominee be that party um we also see the nominee concept used in order to circumvent the forced inheritance shares of Sharia law or to avoid probate and for very simple reasons to protect aging parents or relatives who don't feel comfortable handling their financial matters so they'll have one of their children listed as the bank account holder um, or the owner of the stock or, or whatever the account relates to. And this brings us into problems with regard to the reporting duties on these various forms that we've been speaking about, such as the one Reiner was mentioning, the form 5471 or the 5713, and we will talk later about FBAR. There's going to be a disconnect between what's reported and what the guy actually owns. So if he doesn't report anything, but the foreign bank, for example, may report under FATCA that this person is an owner of an account and the person has not filed the proper paperwork with the IRS, the IRS will come and ask questions. So having a nominee who happens to be a U.S. person can cause an awful lot of problems for the foreign business that's involved or the foreign beneficial owner if he's an individual. One one thing I want to want to add in, in in the nominee, which is which is a little bit of a you know the inverse of that, which is the situation that we see quite often you know here in the in, in the UAE, where in order to you know set up a local company, you need a local partner, and a, mm -hmm. you know a lot of times those local partners uh, are you know to a large extent sort of doing so in a nominee capacity. Um, that's and I think that, you know, that that sort of in the inverse poses a problem that you might have, let's say, a U.S. person uh, that owns 49 percent of a, of a local company and 51 percent is owned by, um, you know, uh, 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 an Emirati national. But the U.S. person for the contract is, you know, entitled to 95 percent of the profits of the business. And, and essentially, mm -hmm. you know, can exercise 100% of the voting rights. So now you have something where in actuality you have a person that owns 49%, uh, but gets 95% of the profits and has 100% of the voting rights. You know, uh, how do you report that? And that's another thing that I think gets pretty complex with, with the nominees in terms of, you know, filing the necessary information returns. And Reiner was talking about the 5471s and the 8865s. That's right. And you need, as a tax specialist, you need to be very, very aware of not only the U.S. rules, but the laws and requirements of the local jurisdiction in which you're dealing. For example, I've had, I've had tax return preparers come to me saying with a UAE LLC, they're saying, well, it's a partnership, right? Because they're thinking, <laughs> they're thinking of the U.S. LLC. Whereas we yeah. know, because we we work here, et cetera, we know what that entity is treated as a corporation under the U.S. tax rules. So it can get very, very confusing and complicated. And I think when you throw in nominees and U.S. people, it just creates a witch's brew. For sure. Some, something, okay. Something about, just a quick situation that, that could cause un, unwanted reporting is if, if someone's coming into a country like the UAE, for example, where they are required to have a local partner, um, the the lo it is a possibility that the local partner is a dual national uh, and and holds American citizenship, for example. So you could potentially be going into business with someone where you don't really know unless you ask directly that that you know they they might be the ones with the U.S. reporting requirements, um, even though they're maybe advertising they're just an Emirati. Um, so that's something that that could potentially good happen point, Ryan. And, i've, I've and, seen that i've seen that occur a lot yeah, where the so, person is actually a u.s national and an emirati and they will not reveal that 
for, for the most part because the UAE requires that you only hold UAE citizenship and no other citizenship. Um, so that's a very sensitive area. Okay, um, moving along to the famous F bar. If if any of the aggregate foreign accounts exceeds ten thousand at any time during the year, the U.S. person has to has to file that F bar form if he has a financial interest in that or a signature authority over any of those foreign financial accounts. And someone who has title to the account merely as a nominee still has to file the form. This is often overlooked. Um, uh, there are certain exceptions for people that have signature authority, but they're probably not applicable to the, the typical foreign situation. And again, the information that's required is, you know, pretty detailed. Name and information about the filer address, the account number, where the financial institution is located, and the highest aggregate balance in the account. So you can imagine if you're a nominee only that the foreign person might not be too happy that you're filing an FBAR, giving all of this information to the IRS about the account that you do not beneficially own. Um, again, the foreign person may not even be aware that you're sending over this information to the IRS. Okay, so there is limited reporting, as I mentioned, for some people. Um, this is typically the employee that has signature authority over 25 or more foreign financial accounts or where an employee is residing abroad for an employer located outside of the U.S. These guys have limited reporting duties. So it's, it's, it's not as egregious as the typical nominee situation I mentioned earlier. But FBAR, the, the penalties can be extremely high if it's not filed correctly or if you miss an account. So this causes people an awful lot of stress when they're preparing the FBARs or they're in a nominee situation. Um, uh, one of the one of the things that I wanted wanted to just add briefly before we go go on to the next slide um, is you know with with the 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 F bar um, you know I mean, one of the things that we've encountered and I'm sure you're encountering it you know I know we've encountered on some cases together is you know some of these poor Americans you know they get hired as you know like a CFO or a bookkeeper or something of a foreign company. And, you know, the CEO wants them to be able to pay bills and stuff like that. And they put them on the account. Uh, and then as soon as the foreign owner finds out that, you know, his account stuff is getting reported to the U.S., the, the, the U.S. employee gets fired. Um, you know, yes. I've seen that happen quite, quite, a, quite a few times. Yes, it can or also... they're being denied advancement in the, in the company for that very reason. They yeah, don't want I mean, them to have any kind of authority. Yeah, I mean, this can also cause a, a, a potential legal problems for an employee if they have like a non-disclosure agreement, for example, with with the employer, where they're not allowed to remit any of this information to another party, but their reporting requirements say they have to. So it, it can cause, uh, you know, a tricky situation where they have essentially two two things that conflict each other. That's right. And again, Reiner, that's why the foreign businesses are saying, hey. If you want this job or you want to be an investor here, you've got to get rid of that citizenship. We just don't want you with it. So it's becoming a serious problem. Moving on to these various forms that Reiner mentioned before, you know, I've been looking into this myself and, and saying, does a nominee have to file a form 5471 or an 8865 or a form 8938? And I, I know that the colleagues who I've spoken to come down on different sides of the fence with this issue. Um, there may be, you know, technical arguments to say a nominee does not need to file these forms. But the problem, to my mind, always comes back to what is the foreign financial institution reporting to the IRS? What's getting reported under FATCA with regard to this account? And, you know, if, if there's a U.S named shareholder or there's the title to the account is in that U.S. person's name, then that information will be going to the IRS under the FATCA rules. And what happens if the U.S. person does not report this, this asset because he says, well, it's not mine. I'm just a nominee. I don't own it. It's not my money. What happens when the IRS comes and starts asking him questions? I mean, that can 
you know, that can end up being a very sensitive topic. And it's, it's and, difficult. And I, my, my feeling is maybe to report and, and make it clear that you are only a nominee, but just to avoid any issue, uh, well, to have see, it I, I, disclosed. I, 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 I tend to agree with you, uh, especially, you know, especially in the case where the U.S. Uh, person is, is, is your client, uh, because even if he's only a nominee, you know, if the IRS does decide, um, you know, to, to come, uh, come after him, he's the one that's going to be liable for his, for the penalties, not, not, you know, the company or the person for whom he's acting as a nominee. I, I know, I know. It's a very difficult situation. Uh, I've had I've had clients become very upset with with all of this. But as you point out, Jimmy, the penalties will be borne by that U.S. person for failing to file the proper the proper documents. Um, the FBAR penalties, which are discussed here on this slide, can be very harsh. I mean, you know, you can be looking at a ten thousand dollar penalty very easily each year for a, a, an an FBAR violation, and um, the penalties can get much harsher and, and really add up. So once you look at the penalties, I think you may be better off to say, let me report, but make clear that I'm only a nominee. More penalties can be assessed for failing to file some of the forms Reiner was mentioning, like the form 5471 and 8938, for example, $10,000 per year for not filing that form. And the IRS used to be a lot nicer and wasn't assessing the penalty, but I've been seeing more and more that they are just assessing it if you haven't filed. One of the things I want to add on the, on the 5471, I'm not sure on the 8938 off the top of my head, but I believe it's the same. It's not just a $10,000 per year uh, per form penalty. It's actually $10,000 per month up to a maximum of $50,000. Oh my goodness. Horrible. Yeah. So. Tough. Is the ten thousand dollar per year just like a lower penalty, or? Um, yeah. So, so well, it, the, the, so there's a ten thousand dollar. Well, I believe the penalty. It if if the IRS notifies you of the non-compliance, it's ten thousand a month. Aha, I get it. So if you're having trouble as a nominee, for example, from your employer or you know not wanting you to file, these penalties can become just astronomical. Um, and the 5713 penalties, we mentioned that before about losing the foreign tax credit and other harsh tax consequences. And, you know, if there's a willful failure to file, you, you've got fines that can go up to 25000 and possible prison term. My God, it sounds pretty bad. And willful, I'm guessing, you know, you can easily be forced into a willful situation if your employer says, if you fire that, you file that, you're going to lose your job. And you're like, oh my yeah. gosh, what do I do? Yeah, terrible, terrible. So are there any solutions to this? We have a few in mind. Uh, maybe you guys have some others in your mind. But what I generally advise my clients is to terminate their nominee relations relationships with U.S. persons and start replacing them with non-U.S. persons. Um, and they should at least be documenting very carefully the nominee relationship. Most of the times there is nothing in writing that the person holds simply as a nominee, and this absolutely needs to be done. And it should be made very clear when the nominee relationship began, even if the document is being done this year and the nominee relationship has gone on for five years, that should be part of the documentation. Yeah, I, one of the things I wanted to add on that is, is I absolutely agree with you that, that you know it needs to be documented that the date that the nominee um, you know, agree that, that, that the nominee started. I even think in those agreements that it's important, you know, to depending on what the asset is, that it's important to enumerate, you know, certain things like, you know, the income from the asset and so forth belongs, um, you yeah, know, to the true beneficial owner. Yeah, carefully drafted nominee agreement will cover yeah. all of that and will and, cover and things in the event of death. What's going to happen? So that you can, it is also important to get it notarized so that you can prove that the document was produced before, you know, let's say the initiation of an audit or something. Uh, so you could prove it, you know, it wasn't some, some, something that was dreamed up, you know, after the fact. That's a very good point. Yes. 
And if it's possible, if you can have actually on the asset that the person holds as a nominee, you know, for example, the bank account, maybe they'll allow you to say nominee in parentheses or something. If you can get anything like that, that's really excellent to help your case. Um, and again, as I mentioned, as far as the filings go, I lean toward file and have a clear explanation that you are only holding this asset as a nominee, just to avoid any unpleasantness with the IRS later on. That's all I've no. got to say about solutions. I don't know if you have any more. No, uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. I, th I think. I think. I, I, you know. I think the the major principle. Uh, you know, when you have nominee type relationships, as as uh, as, as you mentioned with the the documenting the the nominee relationship, you know, I, I agree with what you were saying earlier. I think the big solution is um, to you know to be open about it and try to make it um, as 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 disclosed as possible. You know, so so you know, like you said earlier, putting it on the tax return that there's a. a, a uh, a nominee relationship that is properly documented and also that it's properly treated in that respect, you know, that they, they really honor the nominee agreement. I, I think that's about all you can do in, in, in those situations, but certainly, you know, the best surefire way um, is, is to terminate the, the nominee relationship. Reiner, you have any, any other solutions yeah. you want to share before we move on? I mean, go, going beyond, you know, the scope of just a nominee in, in, in general, it's, it's, wise to think twice before uh you know adding anyone to a company bank account or having someone as an officer to to check you know if they have an american status and any of, of the information that you're authorizing them to have is going to be be shared with the irs so just being aware of of your total your well, that's what our that's what our webinar is all about making people <laughs> just very aware so I guess it's, so I guess it's going to be like any time you do business for with with anybody from now on, uh, you know, whenever you give anybody any type of form or anything to fill out with their name, uh, right afterwards it needs to be a checkbox or you a U.S. person. That's right. Any indicia of U.S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We'll become like a FATCA, but for the companies. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm going to talk about uh, indirect ownership and constructive ownership of entities. So, you know, when we were talking before uh, about the reporting requirements of, you know, U.S. persons that own an interest in foreign entities, whether it be a corporation or a partnership, we were talking about direct ownership, right? So you have John, who is a U.S. person, and he owns, uh, you know, let's say, 60 or in, will you go in this example he owns 80 percent of of uh, a company uh directly the shares are registered to john so this is this is direct ownership of um you know a foreign entity whether it be stock or, or a partnership interest and that's pretty clear if you directly own uh you know shares or or a partnership interest that are, are over the reporting threshold uh, you would need to, you know, file the the 5471 or the 8865. But there's two other types of ownership uh, that people often forget about or don't know about uh, because they're not quite as clear as direct ownership. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is indirect ownership. Indirect ownership is the ownership of an entity through another entity. So th there's an example right below. This is a fairly simple example, but I think it illustrates indirect ownership fairly well. Um, so let's assume for a second uh, you're a U.S. citizen and you own 80% of Company Y, which is a CFC, and Company uh, Y owns 75% of Company X. You would be considered to indirectly own 60% of Company X. 60% uh, of Company X being 80% uh, uh, of 75%. And so this would also make X a CFC because it is more than 50% indirectly owned by a US shareholder. So in this case, you actually have a chain of CFCs. Company Y, where you directly own 80% is a CFC. 
and company X uh, because you own an, an indirect interest of 60%. And so you would have to file form 5471, not just for company Y, which you directly own, but also for company X, of which you are an indirect owner. Um, another example, uh, is just uh, very similar, but assume the very same facts as above, uh, except that X is a foreign partnership rather than a foreign corporation. Uh, you come out with a similar result uh, that you have to file 5471 for company Y in which you own a direct interest and then 8865 as to X, the foreign partnership in, in which you own an indirect interest. So, it's not just looking at uh, you know, the entities that you have a direct ownership interest in. If the entity that you do have an, a direct ownership interest in has any subsidiaries, uh, then you need to look through at the ownership percentage of those subsidiaries and what types of entities they are to determine if there's any uh, reporting requirements in the US as, as to those subsidiaries. So now we're gonna talk to talk about something which uh, can be very problematic uh, in that is constructive ownership of foreign entities. Uh, so you are also generally considered to own shares or partnership interests owned by family members. So you are considered to own shares or partnership interests of your spouse, your children, grandchildren, and parents. And obviously, this can be very problematic because children have oftentimes have no idea what their parents own. And, you know, parents, if they have grown children that are already off in their professional lives, uh, you know, they have no idea what their kids own. And certainly, you know, grandparents knowing what, what their grandchildren own uh, is, is, is pretty unrealistic. Um, so an example to illustrate this is let's assume again you're a US citizen and your son owns 80% of company Y, which is a CFC, and you own none of company Y. Uh, you are considered to constructively own 80% of company Y, basically your, your son's entire interest uh, in, in that company. And you have to file form 5471 uh, as to your interest in your constructive ownership of company Y. Now there is one uh, exception to this. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but the one that we're gonna talk about right now is there is no constructive ownership uh, from a non-resident alien. So in the example that I just gave, it assumes that both you and your son are US persons. If for example, you're a US person and your son is not, then you would not be considered to constructively own your uh, son's interest because he is not a U.S. person. If you assume that uh, uh, you know your your son owns you and your son are both U.S. persons, and your son owns 80% of foreign partnership Y, you are considered to constructively own 80% of partnership Y, and would be required to form 8865. And if you recall uh, with, with that prior example. Um, there was an exception where there's no constructive ownership from a non-resident alien. That does not exist with partnerships. So even if your son was not a U.S. person, you would still be considered to own uh, his 80%. So that's one thing that uh, a lot of people uh, don't know about, and they should, is that if you have family members that uh, you know live abroad or potentially own companies abroad, uh, you would be wise to see if it's possible to find out uh, what they own, not always uh, so so easy. I, I think we just see the gravity of the problem, and um, I hope that the listeners see it as well. Anyway, thank you guys so much for uh, for for participating, thank and, you. and and we look and forward to the next. And people have our contact in case they think of questions later. And Jim.